Hello. Happy Wednesday, everyone. It's so good to see you again. Um, it's almost spring. We're excited about that. And um, I hope that you're outside getting some, getting some good sunshine and exercise and grounding, digging your hands in the dirt and walking barefoot in the grass. Um, but here we go. It's time to do another really exciting interview. You know, we try very hard to bring you um, some really expert people, experts in a variety of topics, and we do want to hear from you. So if you have something you'd like for us to delve into, please, please do tell us either in another show or in the comments section right now. But um, I am very careful in my own life, as well as here at God's Good Table, to bring you people who truly do know what they're talking about, who don't just follow the, the narrative of the medical associations and the agriculture community and, and all of that, but people who actually really dig deep into um, seeking an understanding of what kinds of things we can and should be doing to help our bodies instead of to cause harm, to help our families instead of hinder. Um, to that end, we've brought you a few really excellent interviews, I feel like, including Stephen Hussey and um, just uh, and uh, Mandy Bloom and Sally Fallon Morell and on and on. But today I am really excited to welcome Dr. Patty Powers. Now I want to say something about the Dr. Patty Powers. A lot of people think that we follow people who are pseudo doctors or that we follow the advice of people who think that they know what they're talking about, but they don't really know what they're talking about. Well, Patty does. Patty does. And so I am really excited to talk to a medical doctor with years <laughs> of experience in this field and someone who woke up to what we really need to do and shouldn't be doing. And so with that introduction, Patty, I would love for you first <laughs> to give a little bit more of an introduction and tell us your background and, and what brought you to the point where you are today. Well, thanks so much, Maureen. I really appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. Oh, we're so glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, my journey. So, um, the shorter story is that my dad got interested in vitamins when I was a kid, and that made mom get interested in growing wheatgrass and juicing it, which we all hated, and giving <laughs> us molasses. But it was very interesting looking back on that, that there was not really any attention to eating well. So, you know, my dad had quite the sweet tooth, and so there was lots so you of- had a lot of sugar. Stuff. A lot of sugar, a lot of addicting foods, all that stuff. So anyways, yeah. I decided I want to be a doctor. God led me down that path. And um, I went to the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, which is the military school. Oh. And then did my residency immediately after that in pediatrics. And I... Went off to Germany for four amazing years in Landstuhl, Germany, as a general pediatrician. And during that time, I decided I wanted to specialize in pediatric endocrinology. So oh. I went back to Walter Reed, the old Walter Reed Army Medical Center, and two yeah. more years of pediatric endocrinology. And then that was followed by a, a long career in Army academic pediatrics and academic pediatric endocrinology doing the traditional kinds of things. So I had lots of patients with type 1 diabetes, lots of patients with weight, thyroid, growth, puberty issues. Uh, along the way, you know, dad would still remain interested in all of this holistic stuff, but again, never really ate well. But um, he gave me a subscription yeah. to the Townsend Letter for Doctors and Patients. I used to read that faithfully years ago before the internet. That was where I went. Yeah, wow. Great. So yeah. I was reading this though, and I didn't have a background to know how to implement what I was reading. And as I started talking to my families about 
you know, basic things now, like vitamin D and no soda and trying to yeah. you know, eat well, uh, they, they weren't really on board and they didn't really want to make the lifestyle changes that we really all should make. Right. Right. So my life went on. I retired from the army 20 years ago now and moved to central Virginia and opened up a part-time pediatric endocrinology practice, which was still very traditional. So, um, uh -huh insurance based, you know, doing all the usual things. But as time went by, I became more and more dissatisfied with the state of medical care and the medical system. And the whole concept of pushing drugs to cover symptoms and pushing drugs to deal with, to cover up problems, but never really getting to the underlying cause of things. So it was about 14 years ago that I finally decided to go take one of the hormone weekend classes in bioidentical hormone replacement and an integrative approach to hormones that was offered by the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. So, mm. and I thought I was going to learn how to do, you know, hormones for girls with polycystic ovaries and you know, hormone yeah. replacement for adults. And that's what I thought I was going to learn. And, you know, they had a pretty broad approach to hormones. And Pam Smith, Dr. Pam Smith got up there and she was doing the thyroid section. She said, yeah, I take all my patients with Hashimoto's off of gluten. Mm -hmm. And here I have been in academic pediatrics, training students, residents, fellows, all my career, going yeah. to meetings, the endocrine society, doing journal clubs, doing research, all this stuff. And that, that hit me it's upside the head and it's like, Wait, wait a minute, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I was just floored. So I had to go home and then start learning about leaky gut and all yes. the interactions with food and gluten. And, and so that really changed my trajectory from traditional medicine to what I do now. And as the years have gone by and I've taken more classes and gone to more meetings and done more reading and listened to I don't know how many hours of webinars, and that's still ongoing. Uh, I now believe that the big five categories that cause people problems in their lives are toxicities, nutritional deficiencies, the um, infections, the latent infections, especially things like Lyme and those kinds of classes and parasites. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Bacterial infections can be chronic. The structural, the musculoskeletal structural system being out of alignment. And then, even though I mentioned it last, it's the most important. It's the emotional and the spiritual components of yeah. our lives and of our histories. And so now everybody I, I see now, I'm always looking for which one of those, or it's never one, it's which ones of those are pertinent for this particular patient. Right. So I've, so I've moved from pediatrics. So I established my own practice 10 years ago. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was 10 years ago. I stopped taking insurance and I figured at that point, I live in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, I wasn't so sure Lynchburg would be ready for a cash only pediatric practice, pediatric endocrinology practice. So I thought, well, I can learn how to do bioidentical hormones for adults and thyroid problems for adults. And and that'll be great. And it's turned out to be that you can't fix hormones unless you fix your gut and you deal with the yep. nutritional deficiencies and you deal with your old traumas. <laughs> and so now I see yeah. lots of mostly adults with complex chronic problems, fatigue and autoimmunity and GI problems and leaky gut and skin issues and brain fog and early cognitive changes and those kinds of things. And I do a few hormone replacement cases and, you know, plenty of thyroid problems. And Yeah, we actually have a question about a thyroid problem, but we'll come back to that in a little while. I want you to keep on going. You're on a roll. Well, that, <laughs> but, that pretty much sums up where I, to where I am today. Well, and what you've just said says a lot. Um, I want to talk about are drugs the answer to all of these things? Because that is, as you know, you alluded to, 
that's the go-to. If you've got an issue, what drug, what medication, or sometimes what procedure do we need so that we don't have these symptoms? Right. Drugs are not the answer. Uh, the allopathic or traditional medical system really is very symptom-based or diagnosis-based. Here's your label. This is the, the traditional or the standard of care guidelines to treat. Yeah. Well, I, I don't really honestly need a label to treat somebody, you know, because, again, I'm going back to nutrition and toxicity and infections. And yeah. Um, but you have to look at the whole person uh, in order to get to the underlying causes. And the traditional medicine, short visits, not enough time to go through a whole history. They try to label you, make a diagnosis or establish a name for your symptoms. And then, okay, here's your pill. With a prescription, yeah. Right. All in 10 minutes or less. And that yeah. doesn't work for people with chronically ill problems. It just doesn't. I don't think it works for anybody, honestly, because it's always just dealing with masking symptoms. It's never getting to the root cause. It's never helping the body to correct. Right. And the body wants to correct, right? We're designed right. to be healthy. We're designed to strive to be healthy. Right. But when we put all of these insults onto our, our persons, then including trauma, we can't address that with a pill. No, you can't. No. And that really bothers me. Um, that's God's good table is all about helping people to understand. It's not about medications and procedures. It's about food and healthy life, healthy spiritual life, healthy lifestyle, eliminating or helping the body to rid itself of toxins while avoiding all of that. And I, you and I, I know, are very much of like mind in that it's always refreshing to find another person, um, especially a professional, because I'm not. I refer people to professionals, <laughs> but, but you recognize that, um, we, we have a question, as I mentioned about thyroid, but I'll just, you mentioned Hashimoto's mm -hmm. and I was told years ago that I had Hashimoto's, but I understood gut health and gut healing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm eating my well-fermented sourdough bread again. Good for you. I can, I can do that now without an adverse effect because I did work on my gut health. But that let's talk about um, let's talk about toxicity first. So if that's one of the insults to the body, what are some examples of toxins that we routinely take in, and then how we can address changing let me, that? Let me cover up the label on this bottle because I'm traveling today and I. I'm, not, I'm so thirsty. <laughs> drinking, drinking out of plastic water bottles or just our ubiquitous exposure to plastics. Yeah. Our, our food is wrapped in them. They outgas. We drink out of them. If you drink something cold out of them, it's not as bad. Things don't leach out as much as they do if you're, if you're hot, if your beverage is hot. So, you know, you go yeah. to the local coffee store. And they pour the hot coffee in and you think it's a paper cup, but that pla paper cup has a plastic lining and a plastic lid. We have plastic coffee yeah. makers and plastic, you know, mm -hmm. water containers. And and also the aluminum. Is That's been bothering me too. The aluminum. There's I aluminum. like my espresso machine, but it uses aluminum capsules. Right. So, you know, being aware of your relationship with plastics, being aware mm -hmm. of where is BPA, bisphenol A, and the other bisphenols, which aren't necessarily any better. You now can see BPA free on bottles. No, mm -hmm. they're actually, BPS might be more toxic than BPA. That's a plasticizer. It makes plastic salt. So it's in soft. So it's in plastics. It's in yes. thermal cash register receipts, many of them. So, you know, you go to the store and you get your greasy food and they hand you your receipt and then you put that in the purse and touch it again and you have a plastic shower liner uh, you know all of these things uh, are it's everywhere yeah 
Um, and I'm glad that you brought up that we have BPA free, but we have all of these other chemicals. So it's just like, okay, maybe the water supply doesn't have chlorine, but it has chloramine and other derivatives. Right. So right. labels and understanding labels are important too. Um, I remember years ago when I was reading the fine gold, um, why your child is hyperactive and learning that the um, preservatives are not just in the food, they're often in the packaging. So just like with the coffee cup, <laughs> you're absorbing, the food is absorbing things right. that our bodies then have to deal with. Right. And we either have to store them which and we mostly store those things in fat tissue so that mm -hmm. tends to put on the weight there's this whole class of chemicals called obesogens and bpa is one of those um you you talked about this stuff the toxins in food i recently learned that chicken feed has fluoride in it and fluoride is a thyroid toxin and fluoride I didn't mean that yeah. So, I, had, you know, I, mean, I knew about that being a thyroid toxin, but I didn't know it was in chicken feed. I hope it's not in my non-GMO organic chicken feed, but... Hopefully not. But it's in the water, yeah. and now it's in chicken feed, and it's in our toothpaste and our dental care, you know, rinses and such. Yeah, yeah, which I don't use and we recommend against, but... But it's there. And then we've got more toxins than that, don't we? Some really serious <laughs> ones in our food supply and right. in our air and in our water. Right. So we have heavy metals. It's another huge category. Some of them are hormone disruptors like lead. And lead can be in makeup. Uh, it, mm -hmm. can, it can be in the glazes of, well, ceramic products that are either very old or made in countries that aren't really watching for that. So if mm -hmm. you see made in China on your the bottom of your mug, there could be lead in that glaze. We, we know about lead crystal, but most people don't drink out of lead crystal or store fluids in lead crystal anymore. Yeah. But, so there's aluminum, there's lead, there's mercury. Mercury is used in making high fructose corn syrup. Aluminum is in vaccines and it's in tinfoil mm -hmm. and it's in antiperspirants and it's in antacids. And these things are just ubiquitous. I, I am absolutely mind blown when I sit and think about this very thing, uh, about how 50 years ago, we didn't have all of these toxic um, mm -hmm. compounds in our food, in our water, in our air. And now you're right. It's ubiquitous. It's ubiquitous. We cannot get away from it. So what do we do? <laughs> um, but there are, there are so many, the agricultural chemicals, which of course leach into the water as well. Right. And then get taken up into the clouds as, as things are water soluble and uh, sure. evaporation and the whole water cycle continues right what do we Let's do talk about glyphosate yes i know that's the big thing that's um, another huge problem and it's in the water and it's in the food and it's in the ground and it's in the air and even though you buy food from an organic farmer trying to do the right thing for your body they might or might not have access to purified water for their crops yeah they, and might they might or might not be farming on land that wasn't organic before they moved there. So how do we right. avoid? Avoidance is always the first step, you know, minimizing the exposure. Steel water bottles, clean water. Some mm -hmm. kind of water purification system is huge because we drink so much water. We cook with so much water every day. Yeah. So there's reverse osmosis. There's distillation. There's the gravity fed carbon filtered kinds of ones like Berkey, like Berkey and Alexa pure and pure pro is another one. They all work great. Uh, minerals can be an issue with either the reverse osmosis or the distilled because those systems do remove the minerals. If you're mm -hmm. eating a good quality diet with 
lots of liver and lots of good bone broth, then that's not a big deal. But for some people who are not, then mineral deficiencies are going to start showing up if they're not attentive to replacing minerals. And my understanding with distilled water also is that it's ionically charged uh, from positive to negative or negative to positive. And so it will actually pull, it can pull minerals from your body in order to stabilize or I guess restructure is probably more, more correct. Um, I don't know. I structure my distilled water and structured okay. water is another whole area of, that I'm learning yeah. about. Because water yeah. really comes in four phases. Yes. Uh, you know, steam and ice and liquid. And then there's this fourth phase, gel phase. And that's mm -hmm. how water exists in our body. And that, that phase is charged. And keeping that phase charged means heart works better, brain works better, circulation works better, hormones work better. And so drinking structured water is important. And there's many ways to structure it. There's wands and there's vessels and there's vortexes and there's magnets and light towers all kinds of ways Intense. and some of that some of it sounds really woo woo but it's real a, a lot of what we're going to go into today and and have already started sounds woo woo and people christians might want to might think that they need to stay away from some of these ideas including the emotion stuff but in reality, it's how God made nature to work. That's right. And all so of this stuff, and, it's yeah, go chemistry, ahead. it's biochemistry, it's quantum physics, it's mm -hmm. it, it's all of that. And all of that is God's energy, God's creation. Yeah. And it it amazes me, but it saddens me at how little most people know about it. And so they go on even if they're not drinking their chlorinated city water, they're buying the plastic jugs of water. Um, and they're totally dismissing things like we're talking about because it sounds like it comes from the devil or something, um, <laughs> which of course it doesn't. But um, that, uh, that leads me to think about emotions. And I read the, the emotion code I have the book Feelings Buried Alive Never Died. Uh, right. There's another another one. The body and, the score. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I started to hear and learn about this uh, two or three years ago when I went to a, an event with Sina McCullough at uh, Polyface Farm. And I was blown away. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And then, of course, I listened to an interview that Hilda Labrada Gore did on Wise Traditions podcast with the author of The Emotion Code. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm just, there's so much to learn. Uh, right. There's always more to learn. But th the emotion component to, our, to our, our physical health, as well as our emotional health, it's a very, very real thing, isn't it? It's very real, and it is probably more important than anything we are seeing in the physical realm. Mm. The real work to healing is done in the emotional and the spiritual realms, and problems in those realms leak out into the physical. Yeah, I heard um, at this same event, I heard an, a, another doctor talking about the literal physiology, internal bodily physiology within the brain. And then we went, talked a, a little about this with Stephen Hussey about how it affects the heart as mm -hmm. well, that there are literally physical chemical reactions taking place. And like, um, I don't know it well enough. I'm delving into it a little more as I have time, but emotional hurts, pains, and traumas, even if we don't remember Right. Something that happened when we were a year or two years old, it made an impact upon our bodily, our physical health, right. as well as our spiritual, emotional health. And all right. of that is connected. I, we are such a marvelous, marvelous machine, aren't we? Miraculous. Absolutely miraculous. I'm dumbfounded whenever somebody tells me they believe we evolved from apes or something. Come on, give me a break. Oh, yeah. That's just crazy. Um, so, so what you're saying then is 
we definitely need to address the emotional side of things in order to be healthy. And of course, the spiritual side of things. And of course, the spiritual side of things. Right? Yes, absolutely. There are a lot of people out there doing everything right, but rejecting God and mm -hmm. they don't understand where their problems come from. Right. So what about the effects of lifestyle, for instance, being sedentary or being a partier, in which case you have a lot of toxins coming in as well. <laughs> but then, then um, oh, this, this drives me nuts, Patty. I'll just tell you, I exhibit and often speak at a lot of uh, sustainable and regenerative ag conferences. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are living working every day in a very positive way, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're walking and digging in the dirt. They're getting fresh air and sunshine. They're doing all of this right. And what do I see when I go to these conferences? Masks. <laughs> are you are you serious? Right. Really? <laughs> but even in in that realm of our of our of today's culture people are insane i think sometimes like you're doing everything right why are you worried about breathing somebody else's something if if it if there's even anything to it but anyway yeah so lifestyle <laughs> lifestyle so foundational yeah it and yet we sit at our computers mm -hmm. without all the Wi-Fi exposure. Oh, and that's another one of my notes that I wanted to cover too. <laughs> the Wi-Fi and the and the cell towers and the radiation from our smart meters. And I don't know why we did this, but our bedroom, the right where our heads are on the opposite side of the wall is the stove, a light. We don't have a microwave oven. I haven't had one for 30 years, but um, we're exposed to so much both in our home and when we leave home. Right. And that's like the invisible enemy. That it's impossible to avoid as they put up more satellites, put up more antennas, install more smart meters. We buy more devices that communicate without cords. We become more yeah. and more dependent on our smartwatch and our GPS. As, and yeah, my car has all satellite, things, which are lovely, but right. So minimizing the exposure yeah. as much as possible. Router off at night, all the devices. It's best if you can turn them off at night because nowadays putting things in airplane mode doesn't really turn off all the antennas. And even my cell phone probably has six or eight antennas in it. Um, you can shield with yeah. Some shielding cases or Faraday bags for these things, yeah. although you know they'll block the signal if it's a Faraday bag, which is okay. Um, yeah. But you know, as much as you can minimize the exposure, be aware of where the smart meter is on your house. Smart meters are now communicating your utility usage electronically without a cord to the get to the company, and. Yeah. Some of them, you know, beam that data every few minutes and some of them beam it just a couple times a day. There's a variety of technologies. Yeah. They're not really regulated. There's not really a code for them. There have been reports of fires from these smart meters. You can see pictures of yeah. plants being damaged nearby. I've seen a picture of this like juniper near a smart meter and the, the part near the smart meter is all brown and the part away from the meter is all green. But if you're sleeping on the other side of that, that's on your bedroom wall and you're not sleeping well, that's the first problem. Yeah. You can shield those things. You can opt out or you can change them out for analogs depending on where you are because every state and every district these days is different in terms of how they're rolling those out and whether you can opt out and how much it costs to opt out because there's usually and a fee then, at that point. And then are you really opting out? I just was reading a few days ago a discussion. I think it must have been on our Weston A. Price chapter leaders list. But uh, there were, um, there were uh, some people who did try to opt out. And what they got instead 
first of all, oh, there were photographs too. It must have been an article online. Um, there, someone caught with with their ring camera or something like that, which is also um, emitting right. EMF. Right. But they caught the technician putting something. I, I don't remember putting something different on that actually was still um, emitting EMFs. Um, somebody else, I think, had to sue the electric company because they wouldn't allow them to opt out or they were dragged. Right. Anyway, so opting out is difficult. We don't need to go right. into that. It's neither here nor there, but opting out is a difficult thing for many to do, um, at least to not have them on your bedroom wall. Ours right. is on our garage. And it was here before we bought the house. So ours is on the garage. It's not near anybody. That's good. Um, yeah. So I but so I have chosen. What? For people who live in neighborhoods where the homes are close together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're exposed to your neighbor's stuff too. You know, when you turn on your phone and it connects to the networks and you get this whole long list of networks to connect to. Well, all yeah. those signals are beaming into your area and your device is picking all of those up. And then there yeah. are satellites and antennas that are mounted and, and it's ubiquitous. I have and been, if you drive a Tesla, you're surrounded by much, right. much, uh, far too much of that kind of exposure every time you get in that car. I have been learning more about some of these uh, EMF harmonizing solutions. Yeah. And I am, I am becoming more impressed with their technology and the research that they have. There are some that can show you, you know, when you take blood and you put it on a microscope slide and you look at it, the little red blood cells are supposed to be all nice and floaty separately and bouncing off each other. People yeah. that are exposed to a lot of Wi-Fi or have a lot of inflammation or chronic infections, the blood cells clump together. And when they clump together, then they become big clumps and they don't circulate well. They don't get through the little tiny blood vessels. But after um, using some of these EMF harmonizing systems, you can see a distinct change in the clumping. The clumping is less and the blood okay. flows better. And people sleep better and people feel better. And I like those kinds of things. It's really hard to know without trying them out if they work for you, unless you can muscle test. Yeah. Uh, but... You know, some of them give you a month month back guarantee, you know, your money back within 30 days if you're not happy with it. Because honestly, you should feel better when you're using these things because the EMF exposure is becoming so high. Yeah, yeah. I have one of those envelopes for my phone, by the way. I bought it from my friend, Will Winter, and it mm -hmm. has a front pouch where I can still receive signal. So if my kids, I, I will not turn my phone off because I have kids all over the place, including a couple that... I, you know, I just am very aware they need to get in touch with me. I need to, mm -hmm. I need to know. Anyway, I can still get their calls or make calls if it's in the front of the pouch, but it dramatically decreases the EMFs. And then if I put it on the inside back pocket, it completely blocks everything. Right. And so I do carry that with me and I use it a lot. But Connie is asking, yeah, what do we do? Well, we can do things like the Faraday cages, the harmonizers, but also, how do you feel about walking barefoot in the grass and digging your hands in the dirt, um, working in I the like garden? Right, because, because the nature, they, sunlight, the ground, the earth's frequency, the Schumann resonance negates and, and makes some of the other man-made energies less harmful for us. And also, the think, less, go ahead. Go ahead. The less toxic we are, especially with metals, the less reactive people are to all of this stimulus. Yeah. And, and that we, we take in metals from so many different areas, including I have a mouthful of mercury in my old, uh, in my old <laughs> molars that are filled because we had a very poor diet when I was a kid, but it was cheap. Um, but there's metal coming down from the air. There's metal in the like water, in the, in the chicken. <laughs> coffee pods too, which I'm thinking there's got to be a better way. Um, I'm not using it as much as I was. We actually, anyway, 
we're getting metal everywhere and it does i understand make us more reactive to mm -hmm. electromagnetic fields and uh you know, an interesting thing, and I'm sure you know about this and, and can probably expound upon it more, but um, if, if we are healthy, we repel parasites. If we have a sound, strong, physical body, we repel harmful things. And, and I see it in plants. Um, right. I was looking at my bird of paradise earlier today and thinking about this because uh, if a plant has good nutrition and is in a safe and sound environment, then parasites are not attracted to it. And it's the same with people. That's right. And so that, it, that goes physically and that also goes emotionally. Yeah. Which is an interesting concept, but uh, parasites actually will eat heavy metals. And so one of the thoughts of why we are vulnerable as toxic people is that they are there eating those metals and they eat our minerals too, but they eat the heavy yeah. metals and, and then we don't absorb them. But when you do killing parasite programs, then you have, you release those metals and those toxins and you have to be eliminating well, good daily bowel movements or twice a day is better. I like yeah. using lots of binders and binders are usually plant fibers that don't get absorbed very well. We eat them. And then How about mentally, clay? Clay is one of them, although it's not one of my favorites, but you know, we eat these, these are not well absorbed. And so they stay in the GI tract and after the liver and the gallbladder have done their processing and say, okay, ready to go, ready to be eliminated. The binders are in the GI tract to bind to those toxins and make them big so they don't get reabsorbed and recirculated as it passes down to the exit point to get flushed. Right. My favorites are like charcoal, not charcoal. My favorites are chlorella, which is a blue-green algae, mm -hmm. modified citrus pectin. There are other plant fibers that people use in various combinations. There's carboxy, which is in C60 activated carbon. Charcoal is great, but charcoal and clay and even the zeolites will bind to your good minerals in addition to the toxins. And so they're only really ideally used for short periods of time. You get okay. a little bit of food poisoning or you're getting to, a, oh, I, I killed off too many bugs and I'm feeling a little sick. Charcoal and clay and those kinds of things are great for a couple, three days. But for the yeah, chronic okay. use, I use chlorella myself, but there are others. Okay. Um, I'm thinking of plants that I know too. I used to use chlorella. I haven't for a long time, uh, but the parsley family. Um, Chinese, um, Chinese uh, coriander. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Also known as, um, well, Chinese coriander is going to be different than the Latin, than the Mexican. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Cilantro. Right. Um, coriander is the seed. Cilantro is the is the aerial part, but I've, I've always heard that that was an excellent binder as well. It's a good mobilizer. So it goes deep. Okay. So not something that I start with. My, my basic approach to detox is you have to have the exit pathways open. So you have to be having bowel movements, no constipation, good urine output, clean water in, and then mm -hmm. it's a binder in the GI tract. And then it's attention to the liver and the gallbladder. And then it's, usually attention to the mouth, you know, if there's still residual amalgam fillings, you can't really go real deep because if you start mobilizing that metal out of the fillings, it's going to create problems with your mouth. But yeah. once that's dealt with, then we can go deeper with coriander and iodine's a good mobilizer. And Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. And, and some people Cleaning agents. I just don't usually use those. If I'm going to do them at all, it's either oral or topical. I don't use them IV. I just don't do that in my office. Okay. And then what about saunas? I love saunas because sweating is another one of the ways we get rid of toxins through the sweat. Yeah. I, I actually just purchased recently a sauna blanket. It's like a sleeping bag, but it's an infrared mm -hmm. sauna. Mm -hmm. And I used it about two hours ago. Um, right. I'm trying to use it three or four times a week. Um, 
so I, I don't have a place or the money to put a sauna, right. but uh, especially far infrared saunas, are, are they the best option for a sauna? I don't know if they're the best. They are one good one. There's some benefits to the near infrared too, as far as yeah. how deep in the body those waves penetrate. It's nice mm -hmm. if you can get one with both, but yeah, honestly, anything that makes you sweat is going to be a yeah. good situation. Including work and exercise. Yes. Yeah. So we should be doing that. Um, and whether moving. It's doctor. <laughs> yeah. Instead of just sitting. Yeah. I saw one of my friends yesterday. She has a, a treadmill desk. Yes. I don't know that I could maintain my balance and type <laughs> and all of that, but I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> I'm probably you have to just go slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the idea of continual movement, um, mm -hmm. and we just sit way too much. So, yeah, so many of us work on our laptops or our, at our desks. And that's highly problematic. So movement, um, changing lifestyle, creating better, um, better lifestyle, more busy sweat movement, eliminating EMFs by grounding and that kind of thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why drugs may not be the answer for all of our ills. And Patty, you're about the same age as I am. I want to ask you, when you were a kid, did you see a lot of people who were sick, especially <laughs> sick with things like diabetes and cancers and heart disease? Do you remember seeing a lot of that? No, I can think back to my elementary school and middle school, even high school classes. And I remember one overweight girl. I don't remember any of my colleagues, my classmates running to get their ADHD pills or their asthma yeah. treatments or their antibiotic. I just, we, I just don't. Nobody I don't eat that stuff. And it wasn't that those people were being tucked away so they were out of sight. It just, no. I mean, there were people, obviously there were people who were sick. We still had hospitals. But it wasn't to the level of, and the magnitude that it is now. So what are we doing? Obviously, we've already talked about a lot of it, and we're going to go into the nutritional aspect also next. But my grandmother died at 63 years old. I'm 60, so that's a little bit humbling to me. She had a massive heart attack, and she died. She was a nurse working at a hospital, and I so clearly remember that her bathroom shelves were mm -hmm. covered with prescription pills. Oh. That woman believed in using oh. medication for everything. And she died at 63 years old. So oh, are drugs the answer to our to all of our ailments? No. Or no. procedures. <laughs> or no. procedures. No. You know, modern medicine is great for uh, trauma from a car accident or, you know, if you really need a new joint, then that's great. But uh, the idea would be to prevent that kind of need from even developing by doing all the things that Maureen and I are talking about. Yeah. So modern medicine has its place, but for the, any kind of chronic thing, it doesn't have answers. And throwing a prescription drug at it might or might not cover up the symptoms, but often creates other side effects, which then result in another trip to the doctor, which then results in yet another prescription. And then all these things start interacting. Yep. These drugs, these prescriptions have to be metabolized, which takes energy and nutrients. And so some people don't realize that metformin, just using one drug, depletes B12, coenzyme Q, and and other drugs like fluoxetine, which is one of the antidepressants, carries a toxin in it. It's got fluoride in it. And so does Flomase. You know, there are, there are toxins that are in some of these prescription drugs that people are not aware of. They are not informed of the long-term side effects. Nobody's keeping track of potential drug interactions, even though the pharmacists are supposed to. 
You know, if yeah. you go to different pharmacies and you don't, you know, and, and then there's all the over-the-counter stuff that people take that think, oh, it's safe. No, just because it's over-the-counter does not mean it's safe. Right. So drug interactions and drug overdoses and adverse events from drug prescription drugs and over-the-counter things, not so much the vitamins, but, you know, Tylenol is bad for your liver. The non-steroids, yeah. you know. GI bleeds. And it should not be given to a child to take down their fever. Oh, no. Or, or an adult. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. But that <laughs> that always uh, upsets me. I want right. to say, no, don't do that. Let and the, the body work the way it's designed. Right. Fever is a defensive mechanism. It's helping your body detoxify from whatever is causing all of these symptoms. And it yeah. should be supported. If it's 104, okay, tepid baths and stuff like that, but no Tylenol. No, I think Aaron's, uh, Aaron was the highest. Now I stopped monitoring fevers because I understood that they were a good right. thing. But yeah. the yeah. highest that I was ever aware of with our kids was Aaron at 104, but then her fever broke. I uh -huh. kept her wrapped up in blankets sure, so that the fever, the body could right. <laughs> help itself. Right. And then, you know, she was really sick. Then she was fine. She recovered within 12 or 24 hours. Um, so, yeah, Tylenol is harmful on many levels, including, mm -hmm. including stopping a fever from doing exactly what God designed it to do. Right. So we should stop. Okay. So if drugs and procedures are not the answers, then Let's talk about what is. And and we've already talked about lifestyle changes and um, and about EMFs and all of that. But there is one big answer that we focus a lot on here at God's Good Table and other places as well. Again, it's not the sole answer. But what role does nutrition really play? And, and I have to tell you something. I haven't shared this with anybody, but <laughs> and part of this, I'm, I won't say where this came from, but in a conversation today, someone was asking for prayers for a one-year-old child who has, by all sounds, um, probably failure to thrive, mm -hmm. is uh, totally breastfed, and the family is concerned because it's only nursing. Well... She said, well, the mother was encouraged because the baby ate a cheese puff. And the baby will eat Oreos, but not the filling. And I wanted to say no. <laughs> so no, 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 don't do that. So let's talk about <laughs> what, why nutrition matters. Nutrition is huge. Your body needs all of these different things to make hormones, to make new brain cells, to grow, to do all of the things that we're supposed to do normally. And if we are nutrient deficient, things don't work right. And then the children have all of these problems. They, We have infertility for a variety of reasons, including lack of nutrition. Right. We have failure to thrive. We have you now diabetes and things like that that are becoming endemic as well. And, and I think there might be another cause for that that maybe we can delve into as well, carefully. Um, but starting from even pre-birth. Even pre-birth, right. That's the best time to start. I really like the way the Western Price people promote excellent nutrition for the for the young pregnant. woman who is considering getting pregnant, right? That's the time yep. to start paying attention. Or even earlier than that, you know, you're a teenager and you want to be a mom. This is the time. Don't just wait yes. till oh, I've discovered I've got a positive pregnancy test and now you're going to stop drinking and stop smoking and continue to eat junk. That doesn't really work very well. No, it doesn't. Um, good nutrition starts long before that for the next mm -hmm. generation. Epigenetics proves that. Right. Um, we know that at least seven generations are affected by that first. Yes. So, And there's the emotional, the traumatic stuff also that plays into epigenetics. Right. But um, so nutrition, 
So why do we eat? And I'm not going to go into that. It's just a question I often ask. But if we want to be healthy, we want to be putting foods into our body that build health, right? right. So what that look like real food? That look like real food. Absolutely. My license plate says real food. But what are some specific nutrients? Because you could be a vegan and be eating a perfectly clean um, nutritious diet of lots of vegetables, but does that give us everything our bodies need? Unfortunately, vegan diets and vegetarian diets do not. They're very mineral deficient and they're often very deficient in the healthy saturated fats. Yes. And we have unfortunately been told by various nutritional organizations that saturated fat is bad for us and that mm -hmm. is false. Totally. We need, we need those saturated fats. We need them for good brain health. We need them for good hormone health. We need them for good development of everything, skin health. Yes. We cannot even absorb the minerals in our diet if we don't have the fat. That's right. That's right. People really miss that. So, right. so um, eat real butter. <laughs> Yeah, and lots of it. I, I, I like my little piece of, of fermented bread so that I can get that big wedge of butter into my mouth. It right. tastes so good. Yeah. Um, all of the things that have been vilified, the butter, the lard, the tallow, the ghee, we use a lot of ghee at my house. Um, coconut oil, which is saturated, but not cholesterol. Right. The cholesterol comes from animal food, saturated saturated fat can be animal and plant, but we need those things. We do. So what, what would the perfect diet look like for a nursing mother, say, or a, a pregnant mother or a nursing mother trying to build a healthy child? Adequate amounts of protein. I, I like grass fed, grass finished beef and foraging pork and free range chickens and, yeah. and eggs, you know, good quality eggs, not eggs from feedlot chickens. You know, the quality of the food is important because the nutrient profile is different in those foods and mm -hmm. it's better in, unfortunately, the more expensive foods, but it's worth the investment. So good I've, proteins, yeah. good fats, some veggies, ideally fermented as much as possible. Some dairy, if you can tolerate it, ideally cultured as much as possible. Yep. And the healthy fats and good minerals. So if you're eating those kinds of things, then you're getting them. Liver, I got to tell you, liver is a fabulous superfood. And everybody I talk to about liver kind of gets this face. But there are some recipes for pate, which are just fabulous. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, Weston A. Price Wise Traditions just printed an old recipe that we've made for years at our conference that that I tweaked and and put that out. And it people, it looks like meatloaf. It doesn't taste like liver. It's delicious. Right. right. And you, you can grind up liver and put liver in your chili and put liver in your meatballs and nobody will ever know it's there. That's right. Grind it into the ground meat and make mm -hmm. your meatloaf and your chili and all of right. that. Um and my favorite is chicken liver pate. And we have that, I believe we have that recipe up. And if we don't, Aaron will put it up. Um, yeah, I, we, we talk, and I don't want to be redundant with past episodes, but we talk about how like cures like with homeopathy, but with nutrition, like builds like. Does that make sense to you? It does. Yeah. So, healthy, build healthy bodies. So eat heart, eat liver. Right. Eat, eat the whole animal. And even if you can't stomach it, at least take just pure, clean, dehydrated organ meat in a capsule. Right. Anybody can do that. Sure. Um, yeah. So nutrition is really, is really key. Mm -hmm. But as we've talked about, it goes beyond that too. Uh, we cannot forget about lifestyle, about um, releasing toxins from avoiding and then releasing toxins through exercise and uh, sweat and proper elimination and, and all of that. So um, the crux of my belief is that we should be eating the foods that God gave us to eat, living the life that God designed for us to eat. 
Um, and focusing on our spiritual health as well as our physical health. What would your summation be of all of this? What do you, what are your pillars? Well, my pillars, my pillars for health, which are the same pillars that get broken for people with chronic illness are good quality nutrition, attention to toxin avoidance and actively supporting the detox pathways, staying as healthy as possible because like Maureen said, bugs are not attracted to people that are well. They are attracted to people who are sick. Yep. A visit to a chiropractor or a, an osteopath or a craniosacral osteopath is lovely to see if there's any malalignments. Mm -hmm. Massages and people who do myofascial therapy to loosen things up when we get sticky and stuck is great. And then, what? who are you? Who is God? What is your purpose in life? How are you serving your fellow man? How are you working on your personal development in all of these different areas? And part of all of that is, are you moving? Are you in the sunshine? Are you touching the earth? I, I, you know, are you stewarding the earth? All of this is part of who we were designed to be. Yeah. And, and, and that you've put it together so nicely. Um, I'm in a hundred percent agreement with you and I'm so glad for this conversation. I do want to ask a question for one of our um, viewers. Um, which is about thyroid health. I'm just going to throw it out there quickly, but a lot of people are dealing with thyroid issues as I did and many, many do. Um, what if you don't have a thyroid and you're just, and you're in spite of exercising and eating carefully, you're still gaining weight and I'm assuming feeling yucky. This is just, I don't expect you to go in depth into here, but what are, <laughs> What are some of the things that we can do to help our endocrine system, including, including our thyroid? But because this is one of your areas of expertise in particular, endocrine health is, well, it's, it's one of the, the many systems of the body that, that are designed by our creator and we've messed it up so much. So what, what can we do besides drugs and food? and releasing toxins when we've actually got, oh man, we could talk for another hour. <laughs> I would really love to talk about blood sugar issues, diabetes issues, all of that. So and, just and quick on thyroid though. Yeah. If somebody doesn't have a thyroid and they're dependent on some kind of thyroid hormone replacement, Mm -hmm. That usually is prescription hormone. Yep. The glandulars might work, but that's a lot of glandulars. Glandulars are, are usually ground up pork or cow thyroid glands. You know, they're mm -hmm. not so much regulated like, oh, you're going to get this many milligrams of T4 and this many milligrams of T3. Yeah. Um, for that person, that there needs to be some kind of replacement if the thyroid has either been damaged by radioactive iodine or taken out for yeah. people that still have a thyroid they might need thyroid hormone they might not they might need iodine and selenium and copper and vitamin d and vitamin a they might need adrenal support because adrenals make stress hormones and their function is directly linked to how the thyroid works. And when the adrenals are off, the thyroid's going to be off. But the fix is the adrenals, not the thyroid. And then there's all the toxins. And then you get into energy medicine and light and color and sound mm -hmm. and magnets and laser and all these different things that can help heal the thyroid. So there's lots of different things to do. The thyroid yeah. is actually very sensitive to Wi-Fi. So oh, yeah. you're holding your phone up here. Yeah. And I always use it on speaker or I, I don't recommend Bluetooth headsets. I have one that I use occasionally, but I don't leave it on. And I, I only use it occasionally when I really need something, but, but I don't want to have my phone up here. 
So I never have my phone up there and I haven't for years and I don't keep it around my head or my chest or anywhere. It's usually Mm -hmm. on a counter or on the dash, Mm -hmm. but yeah, answers to, to these things can be very complex because the issues themselves are complex and how we've gotten to this point, um, we need to correct underlying issues. But if you don't have a thyroid, you don't have a thyroid. Right. So what do you, you need do? some thyroid hormone. Usually. Yeah. And that might that need to... Some... So I know many that... people are on Synthroid or Levothyroxine, which is the generic of the T4 version, which is actually the inactive thyroid hormone. Right. People have people have to be able to convert that inactive T4 to the active T3, T3 and not yeah. everybody does. I use a test called the reverse T3 to assess that, and it ought to be 8 to 12. It's often 25 in my patients, which mm-hmm. is telling me that there's too much of the inactive reverse T3 and not enough of the active free T3. And then how do we adjust that? Well, that's stress, that's liver, that's dysbiosis, that's selenium and all these different things that interfere with that conversion. And sometimes people need some prescription T3. The generic is lyothyronine, the brand name is Cytomel, or you can get it from a compounder. But people often do very well on T3. And sometimes I use only T3. And sometimes I'll use T3 and T4 as a combination as armor or NP thyroid. Yeah, I was on armor for a while. So not having a thyroid is a lot more difficult than having thyroid problems. And and I would suggest actually that this person get in touch with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and for that... Um, how can people find you? How can they get in touch with you or make an appointment with you or just see what you're doing? Are you on social media? Sorry. Your phone is dying. We can't hear you. There we go. Okay, sorry. Dealing with That's okay. charge on my it phone. Happens. <laughs> phone running. I have a practice in Lynchburg, and my phone number, if you want that, is 434-382-1825. Got Aaron will capture that. Say it one more time, 434-382-1825. And you have a website as well. DrPattyPowers.com. Yeah. So Aaron will put that in the show notes and... People can get in touch with you then. Um, complex questions are not something to handle in a in a even an hour conversation on on a show like this. So, but that is it's a great question. I'm glad that Lori asked it. And we have other questions too, like how do you know if your chicken feed has fluoride? And, um, I don't know. Just a lot, but um, does help at least. It, it helps to buy organic, but organic is less regulated within the uh, animal food industry. So it's a little difficult. Um, I get I get my chicken feed from a mill that grows everything right there. But, oh, nice. And they're not adding fluoride. <laughs> so um, so I guess that's, that's kind of the short answer for that. But um, Patty is going to be speaking at our God-given food as medicine conference in Wirtz, Virginia, near, near Roanoke and Rocky Mount in Southern Virginia. And we just encourage you to consider coming. The price is very reasonable. It's very easy to find a place to, to stay and it's easy to get in and out of as well. So consider coming and hearing Patty and all of the other excellent speakers that we have coming. That's April 19th through 21st. And you can find more information about that on our website. Erin will link it as well. Um, But consider coming and hearing Patty and everyone else. I am very much looking forward to it. And Patty, I'm probably going to be giving you a call pretty soon too for myself. So (laughs) I'm... I am really careful with who I talk to to get advice, and uh, and, and you're, yep, yep, really careful. So, 
Um, anyway, it's been a great conversation and I really do wish we could go on and on. At some point, I would like to come back and talk about diabetes, both juvenile, type one, type three, that's three things, not both things. But uh, that can be another conversation because that in and, in and of itself is, it's a whole topic. Um, we'll sign off for now then, then and uh, we thank you so very much. Thank so you very so much for having me, appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you and uh, sacrificing your time to come and talk with all of us. So everyone um, be, be looking for more information. Uh, again, we'll put information about Dr. Patty Powers in the show notes and about our event. And next week, come back, we have recorded an interview. I just did it yesterday. I'm really excited about it with uh, Megan Sanctuary, PhD, researcher, nutritionist, and GAPS practitioner. She also is a speaker at our event. So, so Patty, if you don't know her yet, you will meet her. Um, but that conversation will be for next week, and it is an excellent one also. We're so thankful for all of our speakers and all of the people we interview. We appreciate your time, your expertise, and, and all that you give to talk with us. So thank you. And thank you everyone for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and, and share. It really does mean a lot to us if you do that. So with that said, we'll say goodbye and sign off for now.